Hello, everyone. I say everyone. I don't know who's there. Uh, if there are people there, maybe just say a nice little comment. It'll make me feel. Uh, it will make me feel wanted. Ashley, excellent. Good work. Um, so my name is Barney. I will explain a little bit about what we're going to be doing, or what I'm going to be doing. Um, you can dip in for bits. You can dip out for bits. Most of it will be useful in some fashion. Um, so. My name's Barney. I've done lots and lots of different things on the fringes of the music industry. Um, the most recent things I've been doing, I do one-to-one -one consultations for people. I do consultations for bands. Uh, I manage some artists. I am an agent for some artists. I lecture in music business at UCA. Um, but before that, I worked for Music Venues Trust over the summer, saving venues. Before that, I ran the West End Centre and Order Shop for 20 years, 17 years. I always say 20 because I worked there for 20, but I didn't run it for 20. Um, I also managed a band called Ruben way back. Um, I played in bands. I did lighting. I was a tech. I was a tour manager. I was a stage manager. <laughs> I did pretty much anything. Merch seller. I've done a lot. Um, Along the way, I've learned some bits about how it works. So that's all I'm really sharing with you is some bits. I, I'm not pro pro professing to be an expert. There are people actually, like Ben Turk, knows loads about being in a band, who's on next. It's phenomenal, you know? So you can learn a lot from him as well. And in fact, everyone on this, I think Catherine's done an incredible job of pulling this together. It's one of the only venues in the country that's doing this. So, little round of applause, please. Um, so, the stuff really I'm talking about today is it's a, the basics of being in a band. And you would be surprised how many bands come unstuck with this stuff. Even quite big bands come unstuck with this stuff. Um, so, if you're just starting out, if you're right at the beginning, this will be super useful. If you're halfway through, it's probably still useful, even if you know it, it just reminds you of it. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. In the middle section, I will talk about copyright. Um, I don't know a time. If you're only interested in copyright, I would say you're probably okay for the first 20 minutes. Any time after that, it could happen. Um, the, the, way that I, the way that I plan things is very much in my head. Um, so... Calling it a plan is a bit loose. So the first thing is being in a better band. How do you get in a band in the first place? And this is the bit I don't really know. So it's been a long time since I got in a band, and most of the bands I get involved with are already a band. But the, the crucial bit you're trying to do is you're trying to find people who share the same viewpoints as you, the same visions as you, the same interests as you. So you'll probably find that wherever you hang out on the internet, there are people who think the same as you. And whatever gigs you go to, when we're allowed to go to gigs, they'll probably be the same as you. You know, the people there, if you think somebody looks cool, and you think, hmm, I wonder if they're in a band, just ask them, just find out, start talking to people. Because the more people you speak to, the more people you'll bump into who, who are in a band or want to be in a band or what have you. And that you'll find the, the kind of communities grow up. So, I mean, my guess is if you hang out at the lounge bar, you're going to meet some people who like music, and some of those people will already be in bands, but maybe they'll want to join one later when their band has gone wrong because they didn't watch this tour. Um, or maybe they'll just be music fans and they've always wondered about being in a band. Um, for the sake of transparency, I should say I first joined a band before I had an instrument. Uh, there was a friend of mine who had the idea of wanting to be in a band and he said, do you want to be in my band? And I said, yes. Uh, I think he then bought a guitar. I don't think he owned a guitar at the time. He bought a guitar and said, what are you going to learn? And he described the different options to me and I thought bass sounded easiest. So I picked, <laughs> so I picked bass, uh, which is ironic because I played cello. As a, as a, well, even then I, I, I played cello, but I never put two and two together being in a band involved music and music was cello and bass was pretty similar to, ce to cello really that's how stupid i was so you were learning from an imbecile um but i think 
it can literally start like that. You just want to be in a band. If you want to be in a band, you can be in a band. It's, it's, it's not hard. It's not difficult. You just have to understand some of how it works. Um, so the most important bit is finding people that you feel connected to and you are similar to. So let's assume you've found those people and you're in a band. Now, you want to be in a better band because nobody wants to be in a crap band. You know, you want to be in a decent band. Um, apart from anything else, you want people to think you're good when you play in front of your friends. So if you only ever play to 30 people, that realisation that you're rubbish, and I've had it, I think we've probably all had it, that you go, oh no, I thought I was better than this. It only really happens when you start playing to people. That's when you know. But one of the most important things is that you talk to each other, you communicate, and you're honest. Now sometimes people use honesty as a way of being horrible. So they'll say, oh, I'm always really blunt. You don't have to be blunt, you just have to be open. You have to understand that everyone is insecure. Everyone is feeling a little bit on edge, a little bit, you know, they're not, they're not quite sure what they can do yet. They're not really sure. Even the really cocky, arrogant ones aren't really sure. So you have to use your honesty very carefully because people do remember your comments. So if you say to someone, oh, I don't know, that guitar solo is terrible. I hate it. That's not very helpful. But you also, if you hate it, you have to say something. You have to say, I'm not sure about that guitar solo. So just think about how you phrase it to that person. So to each person, it's a different, it's a different thing. People care very passionately about their, about what they contribute. And quite often you'll find, especially at the beginning, you'll find people are only listening to themselves. They're only really thinking about their part. Singers and guitarists tend to be the worst for this, I would say. Bass players by their nature tend to be fairly collaborative. So I think bass players, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I think bass players are probably less so. They probably are listening more. But the, one of the most straightforward ways to make your band better is to listen to what the others are doing and see where you fit. So an example, we had a, a band who were sound checking at the West End, young band. And the guitarist played constantly and he was really good. He was one of the widdly widdly guitarists, very, very fast, up and down the fretboard like nobody's business. But he would not shut up, even during the sound check, even when he was told to shut up because we were trying to sound check the drums. Still kept going, couldn't help himself. It, the idea of hearing himself loud for a PA was all too much for the poor soul. And I think quite often you'll find that, that thrill of of playing when all you've been doing is playing in your room and now you get a chance to play with other people. You have to remember you're playing with other people. It's not it's not your chance to shine. You're playing with those people. And the best bands are the ones that work together. And this this you will like, you'll see as a theme that, that comes out through today. Um but that idea of being on the same page, being connected, being open communicating well it runs through every single piece of being in a band you you can't record effectively without that you can't rehearse effectively without that you can't play gigs effectively without that you can't get to the next level without that so like i say it sounds so simple and so basic but it's a lot harder than it seems um to the point i don't know if you saw the the metallica documentary where they've got their own um psychotherapist working with them do you know that's, that's quite a big band <laughs> to need help talking to each other. But it, but it happens really, really easily. Um, and I think, yeah, so it's, it, you never stop. You never stop having to learn. And every time you think, oh, this is great. We've got it, Sus. We're all talking to each other. It might be that you're not. You also, the flip of that is you need to know when to stop talking. So it's, it's very easy to, to just kind of keep, Keep talking over the same subjects. What you need to do is talk about something, agree it, and move on. Because otherwise all your time is spent talking. And again, I've seen I've seen that, I've been part of that, where, you know, I was in a band where we would 
do a whole rehearsal and not play a note if we have stuff to talk about. And uh, that's too bad. That's too slow. Too much talking. Um, it was a great band, and I love being in it, but we didn't get anywhere because we didn't do enough of the essentials. So keep that balance, but the, but the communicating is really... The next thing, was, which is so obvious about being in a better band, is to get better. And the responsibility for, you, for that is you. So if you put the time in, the chances are you will be a better band. And like with everything, if you, like there's no guarantee of success in the music industry or any other industry, but the more effort you put in, the more likely your luck will improve. Um, so if you are, if you're, if you're a drummer, but it's difficult to play at home, find a way that it's okay to play at home. Like agree a time. If you talk to the neighbors, talk to your family and say, look, I need to be pl playing drums more. Could I do half an hour a day? Would that be okay? Could I do, you know, between, I don't know, seven and eight, as long as I don't play past 10, is that okay? Whatever, get an electronic kit, whatever it is you need to get better. Because what you don't want to do, and I've seen it time and time and time again, especially with singers and drummers, to be fair, because it's hard. It's, you know, it's easy to noodle quietly on a guitar or a bass. But drummers in particular find it hard, and some vocalists, is you, you wait for rehearsals to do your own practice. And that isn't really the time for your own practice. Your own practice is in your own time. Then you rehearse together as a band, which is your project. Um, I, I regularly recommend people play in the dark. So guitarists and bass players play in the dark. Because that way, when you play a gig and the idiot lighting engineer puts all the light, lights off, it doesn't matter. You can play with anything. You can play under any circumstances. Um, yeah, which is, oh, and do do put any questions in, into the chat. I will eventually look at them and answer them. Um, or or if you know Kath, send them to Kath. She can tell me. There'll be, there'll be ways, there are methods. Um, yeah, so I do get off track. I do get off track. So, yeah, so practice in your own time. Now, that doesn't mean that when you get together, you can't do a, a, a little bit of practicing. You can squeeze that in. You know, everyone goes off for a fan back, fag break. You can have a, a, li a little practice. But it's it makes sense that you're not wasting people's time, that you've already got as good as you know how to get for now. Now, what I'm going to say next is very controversial, especially those of you who are studying music. For me personally, what I look for is ideas and emotion. That's what I want in music. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and obviously great tunes, you know. I don't... How do I say this without being offensive? I think there are a lot of courses out there that teach you how to play very proficiently and copy other people. And I think there are fewer courses that teach you to think for yourself and express who you are. And I have seen a lot of people churned out of these institutions and they have been institutionalized. Now it's not all of them, so it's worth asking around and seeing what's what. But if you think about the most special artists in the world, they're normally artists that have brought something of themselves to bear. So if you're not the best guitar player, but you've got ideas and you've got passion, that's probably fine. And you want to get better as you. So I'm not saying don't get better. I'm not saying don't learn. I'm not saying don't learn from other people. But you don't have to copy whoever the hot latest guitarist is if you want to sound the way you want to sound. Um, an old example of that is a band called The Fall, who didn't sound like anyone would have advised them to do. If they'd have gone to a music college, no one would have gone, oh, Mark, I think you should probably sing along like this. It's, it's, not an, it's not a bit of advice that gets handed round. 
um, he would have been told to do scales and sing more in tune and where is his melody line and all of this. But actually, when you listen to bands now, you've got bands like Squid and oh, I can't even think who, you know, some of those bands that are coming through now, they've definitely listened to the full. Like, they've definitely listened to the full. Um, and and so they've become a really influential band by doing exactly what you're not supposed to do. And I say this to bands a lot. If you look back at the greats in music, not not the kind of, yeah, they were fine, but the greats, they were mostly told it was a bad idea or they certainly wouldn't have been told it was a good idea. So the Beatles, they were told uh, guitar bands are on the way out. We've got no need for you. Um, do you think anybody would have would have decided that Jimi Hendrix was what they were looking for? Uh, probably not. I don't think anyone was thinking, oh, that's what we need next. Um Black Sabbath, uh, Sex Pistols. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean the, the lists are the lists are literally endless um, of great bands who did what you're not supposed to do. Rave. Nobody saw rave coming. The music industry wasn't looking for rave. It was, that was not a thing. Um, if you think about you know idols, nobody was looking for idols. No, but there was no one walking around going, "Oh, what I need is the, is is idols." You know. Um, it's it, and it's the same for all of those artists. There's there's very very few breakthrough big artists that the music industry was looking for. They were normally signing whatever had happened last. So once they'd had the Sex Pistols, they then tried to sign the Sex Pistols for ten years without looking for what else was going on, and something else had to come along, which was uh, maybe the Smiths or something. I don't know what the next big moment was. We can discuss that, can't we? So I think, I suppose what I'm saying is don't be afraid of being yourself. I think it's really important that you are yourself. Um, and you're not trying, I mean, we all copy people. You know, how I started off in bands was copying bands and getting it wrong and then I developed my own thing. Um, and I think we all do that a little bit. So it's fine, do some covers, learn some stuff, go, go to get some guitar lessons, whatever. But, but remember who you are, remember what your ideas are, and what your melody lines are, because what you do will be different to other people. But if you learn identically to everybody else, then you'll just sound identical to everybody else. Equally, I don't think it is, is particularly helpful to try really hard to be different. You know, you, you don't have to try to do anything. Um, just Just be the best version of yourself you can be. So we've done the stuff that you can do. So now we're in rehearsals. Now, this is where your choice of people starts to become really important. There are people who play better with others. There are some people who get angry very quickly or upset very quickly. And you might decide that those people are necessary, that they are the most important person in the band. Um, I was in a band with someone who was a musical genius, like he was incredible um and it was only through his it was only through his ability to play like nobody else that made us special that's rude not only that wasn't the only thing we were all good, good but but it was exceptional he wasn't very easy to be in a band with at times um there were moments where he didn't have the money so he bunked the train and then he'd get arrested there are various other bits and pieces. So, so it wasn't easy, but he's lovely. He's one of life's golden people, and he was really gifted. So we looked at it objectively and said, is this worth it? Yes, it is. Right. And then you've made your decision, and that's fine, and you accept that. All bands, not all bands, most bands have got someone in them who does less than everybody else. And it, you get annoyed by it and you get frustrated by it. And the question you have to ask yourself is, do they bring something to this that we wouldn't have otherwise? So there's no point being annoyed for a year or five years or 20 years because this person doesn't pull their weight. You have to accept the fact that they don't pull their weight or kick them out or see if there's a way they'll get better. But in my experience, very few of those people do get better. Um, 
it tends to, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of bands. I've been party to a lot of bands. Obviously, the ideal is that everybody pulls their weight. Everybody does what they can do. So, I was listening to Phil talk the other day, who uh, managed a band called The Levelers way back, and he said they had two songwriters. So obviously, the burden was on the songwriters a lot of the time, but they divided all the other jobs up like it was a democracy. So one of them, they owned a recording studio. One of them ran the recording studio. The other did all the gig bookings. Do you know, you, you, you kind of, you can see how it will even out, but you do get some people, they're just not very good at that stuff. So you wouldn't want them trying to book your gigs or fill in your PRS return or, or design the t-shirts, you know, just for the sake of them pulling their weight. I think, where it has to be, and this is this is pretty non-negotiable, is it has to be something that you can cope with. So if someone is always late for rehearsal and you can cope with that, that's fine. If someone's always late for rehearsal and it's actually a sign that they don't really care about the band, then they need to go. Um, I would always suggest having a conversation first and see whether they can improve, but it's, it's, it's rare. Like I say, it's rare that people improve. So I think you need to, you need to really think about the people in your band. There are some people who just, you know, they're amazing people, but they don't fit with the band. They don't fit with what you're trying to do. Um, this will probably only become obvious after a little while. So at the beginning, you're kind of trying to find who you are and what you are as a band. And what you are is a composition of all of you. So, I mean, I've, 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 I've known bands who are very much, a dictatorship is the wrong word, but like a, they're led by one person. There's one person whose vision it is, one person whose songs it is. And that works. That works really well. That's actually very effective. I was never in a band like that, but I think that was probably because I was too contrary to be in a band like that. I just would have quit. Someone, someone had told me what my part was, but it does actually work incredibly well. Again, it only works if you don't have an asshole like me in the band who constantly questioning everything. You need, if that's what you're going to do, you need people who go along with it and go, okay, that's fine. You've got the vision. That's my vision too. I'm with you. Um, Equally, if it's going to be a democracy and everybody's writing and everyone's contributing and everyone's part of it and they're all they're all helping, you need to work out what everybody's role is and you need to be very clear about what the vision and purpose of that band is. There's a there's a story and I I don't know you two, but there is a story that you two have actually split up twice and reformed as a new band called U2. Now I don't know how true that is, but I like it as an idea. And you can hear the change in their music across time where they've gone, oh, this is a bit dull, isn't it? It's a bit boring. I think we've done this already. Let's be another sort of band. What sort of band should we be? Um, I think it is very useful to every now and then just check that you're all thinking the same thing because you, it's very easy to, to change. It's very easy to, to morph as a band, start as one sort of band, become something else. Again, in terms of big bands i think that's quite often not a great moment like they, they mostly go a bit rubbish um they get bored with what they are and think there'll be something different that isn't really who they are so they, they're trying at it at the same time i've got a lot of respect for any band that tries to change what they are because it's very easy to just knock out the same old stuff um i'm trying to think of a a good example it would just be mean wouldn't it if i did think of a good example so let's not do that you know but there are there are bands that i have been a mad fan of their first album and then they've done the next album and you can hear that it's changed you can hear that the record label or the manager or somebody has suggested that they go in a different direction and it doesn't feel like them anymore and you just think oh but at the same time there's people like pj harvey's quite a good example has kept changing um Radiohead to some degree have kept changing. Um, trying to think who else. I mean, you know, most of the most of the biggies 
have made some sort of change along the way and developed. Um, and you'll like some of it better than others. You know, you get an album that's, that's a bit weak for you, but somebody else loves it. Um, my, my personal confession is The Bends by Radiohead. I didn't really get it, didn't like it. My wife did, she thought it was great, and I, I didn't. Then OK Computer came out, and I loved it so much, I, could, I couldn't listen to anything else for about a year. Um, and then I sort of understood The Bends as a record on the way to OK Computer. But I think Emma probably still prefers The Bends now. So it's a lot of it is your personal perception. Um, one of the other things about being in a band, so we've done the, we've done the kind of personal practice and the, and the personal practice never stops, but personal practice carries on all the way through. It's really important that you keep playing. Um, not in a, not in a boring, dry, oh, better go and rehearse. Just like, that's just, just what you do, you know, you just play, you just play because you love playing. So why wouldn't you be playing? It doesn't make sense. If you like playing, then keep playing. That's all I'm saying. And, and keep testing yourself, keep pushing yourself, keep trying to learn new stuff. Um, we've done the rehearsals. In terms of how you rehearse, I mean, this you will know this anyway, so I'll keep it short, but how you rehearse. There are lots and lots of different ways of rehearsing. It's quite a good idea to limber up a bit at the start. So you just play something you know, or have a little jam or something like that. Then you go into, if you're not rehearsing for a gig, then you're rehearsing a song. So you're looking at the bits of that song. So sometimes you want to break it down into tiny, tiny pieces and, and tweak each little piece. Other times you want to rehearse it through as a whole thing. You might want to try different variations on it. So you're like, hmm, I'm not really sure about that section. Let's try and have another look at it. Um, if you're rehearsing for recording, that takes on another level of detail, which sounds odd doesn't it you would imagine you just you know you play what you would play live in a studio but the people listening to it tend to be listening to it in more detail so it makes a lot of sense to just take every single line and look at it and see is that the best line i can put there is that the best melody i can have there how does that tie into the next bit is there a little something on the drums could we do a little touch of hi-hat that just brings it in in a different way any of those any of those kind of things are useful and recording is generally when it gets brought out generally um i think i mean at some point you need to play all your songs through that's it's it is a part of rehearsing and whether you're recording or whether you are gigging you want to play that through you can overdo it and it's worth Again, this is where the communication comes in, that you need to know what's, what works for each of you. So I know people that can just rehearse, 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 rehearse. They could do it eight hours a day, no worries at all. Other people, they need a break after about an hour because it's really intensive for them. And it doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're wrong. You've already decided that they're the right person, whatever their foibles are. So that's fine. And you need to work for each of those people. So probably the person who is tired after an hour does need a break. But what they don't need to do is have a break, go on their phone, go and have a fag, call their girlfriend. You know, what they need is a short break where they go outside, have a little breather, then they come back in. The person who needs to keep going and going and going, well, maybe they keep going and going and going. But what they do is a little bit of personal rehearsal in the 10 minutes where the other guy's out of the room or girl. I should say that. That's that's very outdated, isn't it? Um, so, so I think that again, that communication. It, like I say, it keeps running through all of this stuff. While we're talking about it, actually, I'll say about recording. So there is a tendency when you're recording to fall in love with your particular bit or a favourite piece of the song. Um, the most clear example of it I've got actually happened to me there's there's a friend of mine called Wolsey Wolsey White who's a producer um, who actually went on to do the hard fi album which was quite a big deal I've, I haven't spoken to him recently so I don't know what he's working on now but probably something very cool and very hip and he recorded my band and he brought his stuff to our studio and recorded us there and 
we had this song and the best bit of this song was at the end it was amazing it was amazing a great bit and we played him the song and he was like yeah that's great but you need to lose that end bit and we were really uppity about it i know it's the best bit and he said i tend to agree i think it probably is the best bit but it doesn't help the song and we were like are you an idiot do you know what i mean what do you mean it doesn't help the song it's the best bit if anything, we should make more of it. And he said, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And eventually, after, you know, very good-natured arguing for about 10 minutes, he persuaded us to try it without that end bit. And we did it without a lot of good grace, and it was loads better. And we, we all agreed it was the best bit, but the song was better without it. And that's one of the bits where you have to get to that point where you can look past your great bass line or your great drum feel or your great keys piece or whatever and hear what is great for the whole band and now this is a big point big point if i could if i could emphasize this point more then i would um you are in a band even if it's your project and you write everything and it's all your thing it's still a band and it's really important that it functions as a band. So you have got clear ideas of what you do and what works for that band. So say you write all the songs and you think that it's great to have a guitar solo in every song, but your band doesn't, doesn't need that. That's not what it needs. You need to really have a think about why you're putting that in there. Is it for your own ego or is it because the song was missing something and it needs that solo. There are loads and loads of examples of guitar parts that make the song. They are the song. You know, there's examples when a cowbell makes a song or a set of maracas makes a song or a little key stab makes a song or horns or whatever. So it doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's wrong, but just ask yourself that question. Because with all of these things, the band is what's important. So when you have a photo taken, you want the photo that represents the band. I I knew a guy who was a photographer to the really big rock people of the 80s. There was a band, German band called Scorpions, and they were huge in Europe. I mean, they were big here, but they were huge in Europe. And they each had a separate manager. And he would take the photos, and they were extraordinary live, extraordinary, you know, in, in the shapes they threw. But you could almost guarantee that in every shot, one of them would be turning the wrong way or blinking or not looking quite cool enough. And because they each had a separate manager, they would all veto photos where their guy looked bad. So he could never get approval for his photos. He had to take a photo where all of the band looked incredible. And that was that's the only way that it would work. Um, which is... a uh, I don't know it's a funny it's a funny situation to be in but it on a small level it happens in in all bands where one person is a bit like oh, I, I like my bit on that but your bit isn't that or, oh I like to do my special thing here or I like to wear this Hawaiian shirt doesn't fit with the rest of the band or whatever it is um, again a, another example one of the bands I was in one of the well the guitarist who was amazing um could only face the back like he hated being in front of an audience and hindsight is a beautiful thing what we either needed to do was stop and find another band or tie in with his aesthetic so if he can't face the audience then i shouldn't face the audience either and instead i tried to make up for it so we had a really mismatched band with me being very, you know, personable and audience facing to compensate for what he was doing. And it, it was just stupid because he was great. He looked cool. He looked great. But I should have done the same thing. But I didn't know at the time. There was no one to tell me. So think about it as a band. Think about somebody at the back of the hall looking at your band. What are they seeing? How is it working? Um, again, for a long time, I was, me personally, I was too, um, 
I was just too rebellious, I think. Like, I didn't want anything. If someone told me you shouldn't do it like that, I instantly did it like that. So we had a record label who said, you don't all wear the same clothes. It's a bit of a mess. And I thought, screw you. Why shouldn't we look a bit of a mess? Not make sense, does it? <laughs> now, we're, now we're saying it now. Maybe we could have looked a bit more similar. Um, you get people who won't cut their hair or won't grow their hair or whatever. And, and again, I, I admire it. But you have to really know why you're making that decision. And it might be what makes you, it, it might be what makes you, you know, the, the, the opposite answer of that is I had friends who were in the band who all the record labels were coming to see and they got told to change their hair and change their clothes and change everything else. And what, what happened was they lost their fan base who liked them because they looked a bit different and then the labels didn't sign them anyway. So they didn't do very well on either front. Um, so we've done, we've done the, the personal, we've done the rehearsing, we've touched on recording, we've done the live stuff. What we haven't talked about is being trapped with a band for a long period of time. So when you're in a band in normal times, hopefully we'll get back to that. Then there's touring, there's touring normally in a small van, normally sharing hotel rooms. It's it's not very glamorous and I, everyone will say it's not very glamorous but like really really not very glamorous um you know you're probably eating pot noodle in a service station because you can't afford the chips or whatever it is do you know it's 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 difficult and it's brilliant because it is you're doing what you love and it is genuinely some of the best times you'll ever have i think being in a band if you're thinking about being in a band and you've watched this far you should definitely be in a band um but it, but it isn't easy, it's not straightforward, and it is tiring. And what you'll find is, again, we come back to who you put in your band. So the people you chose at the beginning are the people that you're trapped in a van with, sharing a hotel room with, you're with them, you know, if you're on a, on a tour, you're probably with them all the time you're awake. And again, we come back to that, you have to look at what you have saddled yourself with, and think whether it's worth it. So if you've got someone who's argumentative or difficult or angry or always sad or addicted to drugs or whatever it is, you have to really look at yourself and think, is this right? Does this work? Are we coping with this? Because at every level, it gets slightly harder. It's, it's not, it, it feels like it should get easier, but I don't think it does. I think if anything, it gets harder because you've got more at stake. So the quicker you can fix those problems, the quicker you can move forwards. So uh, pick an example, not from life, just, just off the top of my head. You've got someone who's always angry. They, they probably need some sort of counselling, but whether you are the person who says you need counselling, you're out of the band, or whether you are the person who says you need counselling, we'll stick with you, that's kind of your choice as a band. One thing you need to be aware of is that one of you will always be a problem. It's not possible to have four people who get on brilliantly all the time, constantly, like, it's, that's not a thing. Um, it's like with every, you know, you go to work, there's always someone that doesn't quite sit right with you, do you know? Um, although I didn't have that at the Westie, everyone was good. But it's rare, mostly. <laughs> mostly you work with someone who rubs you out the wrong way. Um, and that's fine, as long as you can take it, as long as you care about the person, then it's fine. It's the same with addiction. You know, I've, I've known a few bands, some quite big bands, who have stuck with the person through addiction. And if you can do that, it makes you a stronger, healthier, more loyal mm -hmm. band. Um, that's a, it's it's a really it's a really big thing if you can pull it off because the level of trust and faith and and sisterhood brotherhood whatever whatever you would call it is is so special once you've gone through those problems. So everyone has problems if they stay in a band long enough. So. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of examples I can think of of people that I know. You know, I've I've known people 
who their partner's committed suicide, their mum's died, uh, they've got addicted to drugs, they've got off drugs, um, they've, their relationship split up, uh, they've lost their job, they've lost their house. Like, all of those massive life events happen to everyone. They happen to, to all of us. Um, so, so, and being in a band is no different. And what you would do if you're in a corporate environment is you would get, you know, six counselling sessions or you'd be put on a dis disciplinary so that you, you know, you need to improve your game or what, whatever would happen. They would have a structure for that. Being in a band, by the time it shows its head, it, it's, you're quite often mates. You feel like mates. You've forgotten you're in a business together and you're mates in a band. But at the bottom of all of this is if you want to play music for a living, if you want to do nothing but music, and that's mostly why people want to take it a step further, then it is a business and it has to function as a business. So you have to look at your weakest link and your weakest link will change, like I say, depending on what's just happened. But you have to look at that and think, okay, how do we mitigate against this? What do we do to help or what do we do to make it easy? So you get bands who, you know, one person hates being in the studio and you kind of go, well, is it important that they're in the studio? Can they record their part and go home? Does that matter? Does that matter to me? Why, why does it matter? that the drummer has to sit through three weeks of recording after they've played their bit. At the same time, it might be that that does matter because you need to know that they care. Um, and, that's, and that's a really important part for you, in which case you just have to be open and explain and communicate why it matters. And mostly, when you've explained to somebody, not in the heat of the moment, not flinging cups across the, the room, you know, but when you've said, when you do this, it makes me feel like this. And they go, ah, okay, I didn't realise. When, when you do that, that makes me feel like this. Because those communications, again, keep coming back to it. And so much of it is about that. Um, and, and checking all of those things. And all of this time, what you're doing is layering on top. So all of the things that you did at the beginning are still important. So you still need someone creating I, I mean, ideally all of you creating, but you certainly need a songwriter. You need to be practicing all the time. You need to be rehearsing regularly. Um, you need to be playing live and getting, getting ready for that. You need to be recording and getting ready for that. All of that stuff, at the beginning, you're not doing all of it. But everything you add, you don't stop doing the other. Does that make sense? So the further in you go... So I'm trying to think, like, uh, there's a guy called Frank Turner. He's incredibly hardworking. And I've seen his interview schedule, and it's crazy. Like, but he still has to do the songwriting, the practicing, the recording, the gigging. But it, on top of that is this responsibility for interviews. And interviews sound really fun and interesting. You know, when you read an interview, you're like, ah, I wouldn't mind doing an interview. Sounds great. But you can end up doing a whole day of interviews. You can literally start at 10 in the morning and run through till 5, do you know? Um, and at that point, interviews aren't that interesting because everyone's asking the same thing, you know? Everyone's asking about your latest album because that's what you're there to talk about. Everyone's asking about the disaster you had last year or the bandmate you used to not get on with. Um, so it's, I think that stuff gets quite wearing and a lot of, a lot of musicians don't enjoy it. And there are some bands where they, they allocate that responsibility. So REM, for example, were very, very happy for Michael Stipe to be the one that was interviewed because they had no interest in it at all. You get other bands that they want to be featured, they want to be thought about, and then it gets very difficult because the press quite often only want to talk to the singer, you know. Um, and sometimes they're not even the main songwriter, but they're the face of the band, they're the front person of the band. So... That's another bit of how do you work out your 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 kind of you call it petty jealousy sounds mean, doesn't it? And I don't really mean it like that, but but it's quite it's quite natural to feel left out. It's quite natural to feel overlooked. It's quite natural to feel less important than somebody else. And it's and it's really important that 
everyone feels valued for what they bring to it. And I think if you if you do feel valued for everything you bring to it, you probably don't mind so much when the singer's always getting an interview and you understand that it's hard work for them, but it's not just easy. It's it's hard. You know, being that person, being always in the in the spotlight is hard. I'm going to talk a little bit about songwriting and then we will move to copyright, do a little stint on that. Um, so songwriting, it really helps to understand other songs. So it helps to pick a song apart, learn how to play it, understand how it lives and breathes and works and try and do your own version of it. All of that stuff helps. But some of it is inside you. Some of it is the tunes inside your head. Um, and you, the more you flex that songwriting muscle, the better it gets. And you will find that there are some things you find harder. So maybe you find lyrics harder or you find melodies harder or you find you know, chord structures harder, whatever it is. And you do a little bit of work on that. So that is, it's just work. If you want to write songs, then you want to write good songs. So you want to learn how to write good songs. So you do a bit more work on the, on how to, that works. Um, it's quite useful to write with other people. That's quite a helpful thing. Bear in mind copyright. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, the bands that I was in, we tended to write collectively we didn't really write separately which which gave them a very a very particular feel um on the other hand jamie in reuben wrote the songs they were his songs um and the others that would add little flavors but but he had the whole you know the whole thing would play in his head he could hear it he could hear the song as it would be um and every every option in between those two extremes works you know there are people who just pour it out from inside and they don't even know it's coming and out it comes there's other people who craft it very carefully you know they're classically trained pianist or whatever and and any of those can be a can be an option but i think it's quite a good exercise to understand how the other option works so if you're someone who always writes a certain way try the other way try doing it a different way just just for fun apart from anything else because it's fun you know set yourself a task so if you normally write because you're jamming and then you work out those bits of jamming then try writing a really concise song and if you always have it perfectly formed in your head then try jamming around with some other people and see what comes up because it will it will broaden your abilities and it will it will build your your capability as a songwriter i think now and again somebody somebody else will be able to say this better than me so i, I won't but i would probably scour the internet for it there are a lot more songs being written with a lot more people involved so people are nicking a bass line from one thing or they're taking some samples of drums or something else or they're they're trying to write a song exactly like this um, a friend of mine fairly recently did a, a songwriting session for a pop act where they pretty much listened to a song and thought, yeah, we want it to sound a bit like that and then changed small elements of it so it wasn't stealing copyright and then wrote a song on it. So I think that's happening more and more with technology. It's much more easy now to, you know, pinch a bass line and then tweak little bits of it so it's not quite the same. For me, that's not what I want to hear. Well, I don't think it's what I well, want to hear. Maybe that is what I'm hearing all the time now. I don't know. Um, but I think, I think the great songs have come from people who are passionate about what they want to say or very, very musically able, um, who can create something. You know, some of the pop songs of the 30s, they don't really come from the heart. They're very constructed but they're very, very well constructed, you know? And then if you look across genres, you know, if you're looking at, you know, I don't know. Well, think, think about some of the metal bands, you know, they're not, they're not going for the melody, but they've still got hooks. They've still got stuff in there that makes you go, oh, I love this track, you know? And that's, and that's really what we're talking about. Not everything has to be a pop song. 
you know, the, one of the bands I played in used to do 11 minute songs. That was what we did. And that's what we wanted to do. That was great. That was what we were all about. And so that's fine. You, you do what you want to do and then take it somewhere else. Um, I'm trying to think of, of bands now, like Pigs, 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 Pigs. They're very definite. They're a definite band. They make, they make a particular sort of sound. And they weren't trying to get on Six Music, as far as I can tell, but they did. Um, there's a there's a whole load of those sleepy mods, you know. That's not they're another full band, aren't they? Um, but yeah, they're not they're not trying to be a pop band. Then it didn't set out to be a pop band, but they've got loads of hooks. And they kind of have turned into a pop band in a in a funny sort of way. Um, Slipknot were a massive pop band. Like their songs were pop hits, but it was disguised in scary masks and growling, so that nobody thought about it much at the time. Um, but yeah riddled with hooks um yeah so songwriting hone your songwriting and and don't be put off i think it's quite hard if you've got someone who's if you've got someone who's really good at songwriting in your band it can be very off-putting and you end up not writing your your songs because you're a bit in awe of them maybe you know or you don't feel willing to put your sections forward. And what I would suggest is you probably have a conversation around um, and say, I feel a bit awkward in the way that I bring it forward. How do you manage it? How does it work? I would like to contribute. Just so you're, again, keeping those channels open. And it might be that your songs aren't very good and you end up getting told, no, your songs aren't very good. But again, we come back to that very first point of be honest, but be kind in the way that you're honest. There's no point in lying. Oh, it's a great song. Yeah, we'll always play it if you all think it's rubbish. But you have to find the right way of saying that it's rubbish without without destroying that person forever because they may go on to be a very good songwriter. Um, and that's another thing is people people develop at different points. People, Some people are only really ready to write songs when they're 30. You know, other people, they're writing them from the age of 10. It's, it's, it's different for everybody. And all of this understanding and communicating and all of the stuff that's going into being in a band is exactly that. It's exactly that of understanding that everybody's different. That everybody is different. You don't want to be in a band with five people who are the same as you. You want to be in a band with five different people who all bring a different strength. There's, there's a real there's a real power to that, but you have to harness it for the good of the band. You have to think about the band all the time. So, copyright. This is going to be really brief, um, but I think it's really helpful to be aware of. Uh, where are we? About an hour in. Oh, sorry. I do talk, don't I? Um, so, copyright. The... Within the music industry, there are lots of copyrights, but the two big ones are in the song and in the recording. So when you record a song, you are creating two copyrights. So is there is the song, well, three, kind of three. So there's the literary work, which is the lyrics. There is the musical work, which is the music. And there is the recording, the sound recording copyright. Now, the the song, we talk about it as being a song. So the, the literary and the musical are both wrapped up in this term song. So the song itself is, in Britain, is copyrighted by its very creation. So as soon as you write it down or record it, you have created a copyright. If you, if you are in America, I believe it helps to have registered it in some form, but we're not in America, so we don't need to worry. And you are, by creating it in Britain, you are covered by the British rules, which do hold up in US courts. So let's ignore that, that thing. Copyright is slightly different in, in everywhere. And I, I recently went on a CMU webinar and i would recommend cmu 
to everybody, CMU is very good. There is a guy called Chris Cook who is incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and he pointed out to me, which I didn't know, that there are basically two two schools of copyright and there is the English one and the French one. And the rest of the world have basically adopted one version or the other. The English one, which says so much about our society, doesn't it, is built around um, ownership, property ownership, that we have the right to, to control what we've created. The French one is much more about the freedom of of the person to express themselves, <laughs> so, but, but, but either one. Um, so we'll look at the British one. So the copyright is basically your ability to control what you have created. So if you wrote a song and someone else heard it and then they made a massive hit out of it, that wouldn't be very fair, would it? Because you have generated something of value. So the way that it works is that your copyright is created as soon as you've either written it down or recorded a version of it. Um, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And if you have it played on the radio, for example, then you would get a fee. So if you get it played played on Radio One anyway, uh, you would you would get a fee for that play. And that that fee you want to come to the creator. You don't want it going to somebody else, you can, when you start making money from songs, you can assign your rights. So although you have the right in copyright because you've, you're the creator, you can assign it. So you will quite often, just thinking about the song at the moment, you might assign it to a publisher who would collect the money on your behalf and probably pay you in advance. Uh, well, definitely pay you in advance um, for the rights to that song. They would own the rights for a specified period of time. So sometimes in the olden days, people used to own them forever. Now it tends to be much shorter, um, which is better. But at the same time, you make most of the money on those songs early on. So if a publisher owns the copyright for 10 years, that's probably enough because who cares after 10 years, you know? It's unless you have a massive record that ends up being forgotten about. Um, in terms of the sound recording, so the, and this is really important, the owner of the copyright in a sound recording is whoever did the organising for that. So by organising, we tend to think of paying for it and booking everything. So, as an artist, you want to make sure you're doing as much of that as you can yourself. It's, it's frustrating and annoying, but there are people out there who are only looking after themselves. And you have to be aware of that. So, for example, somebody might say, oh, I'll book the studio for you and I'll pay. What I would recommend is that they pay you and you pay. So if they want to pay for it, that's fine, but they can give you the money to do it with and you book the studio. With all of these things, you want it in writing, really. You want, it, you, you want something that says, I own these recordings or the band owns these recordings. It's, it's such a... It's not a very nice area to talk about because it because it implies that everybody's horrible and greedy and most people aren't. Most people are lovely. You know, in my experience, most music people are people who are just trying to help you out. But you do want to know who owns the copyright. It's, it's important to understand who owns the copyright. Um, going back to songs again, the who who wrote the song is important. Now, different people work in different ways and none of them are really more valid than any other. The, the way that it works is, try and explain this, it's, it's hard to explain. This is where you need Chris Cook. Um, if you, so for example, the, the popular example that's always wheeled out is Queen. 
the band Queen all used to write songs. So they were all songwriters. And they were all pretty good. And they had some, some pretty decent, decent hits between them. But what, what they felt was that they were competing with each other to get their songs on the record or on the B-side of the single or to be the single because those records made more money. And writing a spare track didn't really help much. And so they went from being individual songwriters claiming for the songs they'd written to sharing it 25% each. So whoever wrote the song, they felt it helped them put the best songs on the record. But they weren't thinking about who wrote this. They were thinking about, is this a great record? It, it, at the beginning, it doesn't really cause any problems who writes the songs. You're just pleased you've got a song. You're pleased that somebody's written the song. Later on, it starts to create a few problems, and that's it, especially when money starts to roll in. Um, a band like Oasis are the, are the other end of it, where Noel wrote all the songs and took all of the publishing money. So all of the money that came for the song, so the recording, they all shared in, but the, all the money that came for the song was his. So at the beginning, it makes perfect sense because he did write all the songs. So, so why would he share that? And he gets a little bit of money for it, and so what? Because of course he gets a little bit of money for it because he's the one who stayed up in the hotel room at two in the morning trying to write the next hit, you know. But as time goes on, it becomes harder and harder to keep that band together because, you know, he's driving around a Rolls Royce. The rest of the band are hanging out at Burger King. I mean, not quite that extreme, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Um, I've known bands where one of them goes first class in airplanes and the others are all in second. You know, that doesn't build a strong band. <laughs> it doesn't help, does it? So you need to think about those things. Um, I won't give you any advice on what to do. What I would say is important to talk it through and talk to a lawyer. And when I say a lawyer, I'm in a music lawyer. Um, but certainly talk it through. Work out how you all feel about it. The other end of it is if you do share, say you say it, share 25% each like Queen, and you go, well, that sounds fair. Let's do that. But then one of you is still doing all the work. One of you is still writing all the songs. One of you's up at two in the morning trying to craft that latest gem. Then that creates bitterness because that person's then giving away 75% of the, the money that they should be getting paid for writing the songs. So there isn't any easy answer to it. I don't, I think you have to do something that suits the whole band. And, and the, I mean, one answer is if you want money for songwriting, then write the songs. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. So, you know, if you want that money, then write songs. And if they're no good, write better ones and write better ones and write better ones until they are good. Um, there is there is a significant sum um, possible from the from the writing. Um, another thing that happens, well, it seems to be starting to happen a little bit more. Apparently, it happens a lot in urban music. Um, is people pop into the studio, hang out for a little bit, and then claim a small writer's credit for being involved in the track. And I, that feels very shaky to me. And the same with producers who want to claim some of the money because they've helped write it. Um, it depends, but to, to some degree, that's a producer's job. A producer's job is to say, oh, I think that course is too long or why don't you cut that mid late? You know, if you count that as helping with the songwriting, it just doesn't feel ethical to me. Um, but again, cross that bridge when you come to it. Um, what I would say, and, and well, what everyone would say, in terms of copyright, even an exchange of emails is enough. There are apps you can use where you work out the split per song, or you can write an agreement that says we will split everything for this, you know, we'll do everything four ways, five ways, six ways, whatever. Um, you might decide that the person who writes the tune and the lyrics gets two shares because that's, you know, a sound and a lyric or they might get half of it or you know there's 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 as many ways as you decide but it's something you want to talk about because what you don't want to do is find that the person who's contributed the least still thinks they're entitled to a share when the rest of you don't and that can get very uh, very tricky 
So I, th I think that's the big stuff with copyright. I'm trying to think, I mean, other little little bits of copyright. So there is a copyright in photography, and that is owned by the photographer unless you agree otherwise. So if you have a banned photo, the copyright is owned by the photographer. Um, what is normal is that you would buy it if you wanted to control it, or you would pay for the shoot. Um, and that's negotiated with the photographer or their agent or whoever. Um, but photography, yeah, because we all have a camera phone, you know, we, we kind of forget that that's, that is protected by a copyright. And when you, when you sign the terms and conditions on something like Facebook, you are giving your, you're giving your permission that they can do whatever they want with it. Um, it's, it's the same as you would with a band. So when when photographers would take photos at West End Centre in Aldershot, I always used to insist that the venue and the artist were allowed to use it freely, except for commercial gain. So if you're going to take that photographer's photo and stick it on the album cover, then you probably need to talk about some payment. But if you've given them a guest list and they've come and taken some photos, it's fair enough that you should be allowed to share it on your social media. You know, that's, that's not... That's not terrible. Um, I am not a photographer, so photographers may argue with that. If there are photographers, I haven't checked the uh, little dude up a little bit. Um, yeah, so yeah, you might argue if you're a photographer that that's how you make your money and you want to own all the copyrights. To me, if you have created a beautiful scene from virtually nothing, then that is your creation. If you've taken a photo of a famous band member, that's a slightly different issue because say you take a picture of Elton John, the value of that photo isn't just your photo, it's also the fact it's of Elton John. Does that make sense? Um, but again, you can you can disagree about it, but you need to have an agreement. You need to know what it is you're agreeing to. Uh, same with artwork. Artwork's got a copyright. Um, video has got a copyright. And it's making sure that, that you know who owns the copyright. Because I come from a band and artist and manager perspective, I think the artist should have everything. I think the artist should have the rights to their video because it's made of them. I think it's right that the artist should have the rights to the recordings. Um, without the artist, we're left with nothing. So I, I, I believe quite strongly in that. But I do get that there are different opinions. And, and again, it just needs to be that, that conversation. Um, this is controversial especially before recording talk. My personal belief is that if a producer works with you for three weeks and turns in a great record, then they should be paid handsomely, you know, for what they've done. But they have not gone on tour. They have not been at rehearsals every week. They have not stayed up till two in the morning writing the songs. What they've done is they've come in, they've done a three-week job, and they've done a very good job of it. I don't think they should have any of the songwriting unless they have massively influenced the songwriting, like write half a song, fair enough. But um, I don't, I don't, th I think a producer is a different, it's a different job to that. And I think more and more people are trying to take a piece of that pie um, because records don't sell as much. So they still need an income. So they're looking at what they can, what they can bargain, what they can take. But it, it feels it feels unfortunate to me and again producers will say will say otherwise it's only because i come from an artist and a and a managing management perspective um any questions about copyright oh hello any advice around sampling in songs at grassroots level yeah it's a tricky one isn't it uh, we use something in our electronic setup. Seeing I'm doing something seems fair, also a lot easier when you're a bigger act. Yes. Now, I don't know loads about this, so don't take everything I say as gospel truth. You probably want to look somewhere like Musicians Union website. It's probably got information about that. Um, there is a lot of information out there if you, if you start looking, and you will soon recognise places like... Um, Featured Artist Coalition, MMF, CMU, Musicians Union, 
uh, oh, there's one that starts with I. It's got four letters in it. I S. I can't think. Maybe someone will stick it in the chat if they can think what it is. Um, those sort of trusted websites that are good places to look. What you should do, so one of the copyrights is adaptation. So if you are adapting somebody's song, then you need permission. If you don't get permission, they own the copyright. So if you took, I don't know, pick a song, a Biffy song, and you change the lyrics and put in a different section of music, if you haven't got permission to do that, they would own your song because what you've done is adapted their song. Um, so what you would normally do is have a conversation. Obviously, when you're slightly bigger, you'd have a conversation about it and be fine. At a small level, kind of doesn't matter. If you want to do your own version of a Biffy song and they get the copyright of it, so, you know, you're having fun. In terms of sampling, what you should be doing is getting permission because you're using part of their music. The chance of you getting permission when you're in an emerging band is actually quite difficult. You might want to consider using your own samples, like creating your own original samples, or using samples that are already cleared because they're part of a, a sound bank. can't think of the right word, but you know what I mean. But if you want to use like a, a known piece, Oh, do you know what? This, this is really hard. I think on a DIY level, people just do it. I think they just do it and then cross that bridge when they come to it. But it's it's not very helpful for what comes next. So if you then have to clear all your samples, you know, say say you, you do really well, you've got some great songs and you haven't cleared any of the samples, at the point where you sign a record deal or a publishing deal, someone is going to have to clear all those samples. Um, the good thing is it won't be you, you know. So if you're signed to somebody else, someone else will have to do it, but it won't make you flavour of the month. Um, and the way that it tends to work in big artists is that if they sample something and they shouldn't have done, they have to pay some money. So again, everything just costs. So there will be a there will be a financial cost to using those samples at some point down the line. I suspect for now, you don't have to worry too much. As long as you're not sampling, you know, your your song is, you know, ninety percent yours with a few samples, it's probably not the end of the world and nobody's gonna want to take you to court because you're a small band. It won't look good if I don't know, whoever, you know Can't think of his name. Sly and the Family Stone. Anyway, um, well, Sly and Robbie, for example, if they, you know, it's not a good look to take a band to court from Alton because they've used a little snippet of what you do. Um, but at the same time, as soon as you start making money, they will want their money and they will want a big old slice of money. So that's that's just something to really be aware of, I suppose. Does that help? Uh, yeah, this is my struggle. A lot of artists I admire breaking through, uh, break through an interesting sampling, and there's no way it was cleared at that level. The easiest thing at the moment seems to be to hide it really well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> there is there is a bit of that. I think I think with with all of those things, it's it's being aware of what what could the issue be. So what when you're sampling something, what you're doing is stealing it essentially unless you're paying for it or have got permission to do it. Um, and all the time you're little, it probably won't cause you a problem. I don't think it's a terrible issue. I don't think big bands would really care. They wouldn't want, you know, 300 emails a day saying, please, sir, can I sample this? At the same time, once that starts generating some money, you're into a bit of a tricky minefield. And that's the thing to be aware of, is that is that there will be a financial implication at some point. That's what I would... That's what I would say. Um, and also how essential those samples are to your sound. Could you make your own samples? Could you could you create your own things? Or is is it sampling a really famous, well known bit of music is what makes it cool, you know? Um, oh good. I'm pleased, Danny. That's great. Um, I, I wish I was more of an expert. 
and I and I think I would just look on some of those trusted websites to see to see what what the official answer is. Um, yeah, again, if I was doing this as a consultation, I would go away and find it out and send it to you. But um, but I'm not, so I probably won't. It's probably better that you find it. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. And again, all of this stuff, this is the stuff that I go through with people. So any, there is no stupid question. One of the things you need to know now is there is no stupid question. All of the sessions I do with people, and I do sessions with people who are, they, you know, they're signed to labels, they've got a bit of success. And I also do some sessions with people who are not signed to anybody. And you would be amazed at the stuff that people don't know. Um, it's, it's, you know, just because you're in the industry doesn't mean you know it. There are, there are people working in record labels who don't know some of the stuff that we've talked about. There are, there are agents who don't know some of the stuff we've talked about just in this session. So th there is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, if anybody does want to uh, ask me things privately, I'll give you my email. It's Barney, B-A-R-N-E-Y, at kickartsuk.com. Uh, yeah, Barney, at kickartsuk.com uk.com um if if you have got questions then bang them in the chat because it it quite often helps other people so if you've got a question chances are someone else has got a question too but i know it can feel a bit hard it can feel a bit difficult to to ask those questions but it's it, it's important and it's only by asking that you find out I've been very, very lucky in that in my time, I've met a lot of people to learn from. So I've learned from managers, I've learned from agents, I've learned from PRs, I've learned from lawyers, I've learned from all sorts of people, musicians, you know, lecturers. Um, and and I, I try not to ask the same question to the same person twice, but there are times where I need to find out more and I need to go over it again and try and get it straight in my head. And it's really helped me. So I would say, ask people for help. Most people are really happy to help. That's that's not work for them. That's that's helping share something they already know. So they're they're happy to do it. Um, I'm going to move on from copyright. What I would say is, where are we for the time? I do Java a lot. Um, oh, that's good. What would be your advice financially and copyright, etc., for dealing with songs where a band member has left the band but it still moves forward? Right. So, one of the things here is if they've written the song, then it's still their song because they're the songwriter. So the copyright, if someone has left the band, but they wrote that song, they will still get royalties for that because they wrote the song. I think in an instance where they didn't write the song, but you want them to have some money while they're in the band, that is something to draw up a particular agreement about. So again, I would look at the MU, or if you're a bit further on, and we'll talk about that in a second, I would talk to your lawyer about it. Um, I think it is absolutely fair that after a band member leaves, they don't get money from that song if they didn't write it. Quite apart from anything else, if you imagine being the new person, so you're the, I don't know, whoever, you're the new drummer in the Arctic Monkeys, if all of the money for the songwriting was going to the last drummer and all he has to do is sit at home while the royalties roll in, you're sitting playing the drum, it, it might start to feel unfair and you might be poorer than the rest of the band. You know, you'll be sitting on a bus going to a gig when they're in a plane. Um, nobody wants that. At the same time, if the drummer wrote the song or contributed heavily to the song, then, then they should still be getting paid because they did the work, the work. You know, what you're getting paid for is the work. And the work you put in was writing that song in the first place. Um, most bands don't get famous. So, you know, the payoff is if you do get famous, then you still get some money, which is great. Um, do, with all of these things, the important bit is to write it down. Is to detail what it is so that everybody's really clear on what it is they've agreed to. That if, if the drummer has has written the song then that's it's his song if he's written some of the song it's some of his song and if he hasn't but the songwriter's just given him a slice to be kind then he needs to know that that's all that's happened 
because it's you would you'd be surprised at how many people think they write the song. It's it's not as easy as you imagine. So when I was when I was playing in in Kilter, who were a little band, didn't get anywhere. Little mention on Radio One and a and a bit in the enemy. Um, I absolutely thought that I was a quarter of that band, and every song I thought I was a quarter of that song. And I look at it now with the benefit of hindsight and think, well, Inga wrote the melody and she wrote the lyrics, and I just wrote the bass line. <laughs> Look, I, I don't know. I don't know that many people would think I was a quarter responsible. And I still don't really know where I stand on it. I think probably Inga should have had half and we should have split the rest, or she'd have, she should have had 40% or, I don't know, however, however we worked it out. Probably that, probably 40% for her and then 20% each for the rest of us. Um, but it doesn't matter because we're small, so it only really matters when the money rolls. Um, and I think you also have to think about the circumstances in which a band member might leave. So a band member might leave because they've got cancer and you really want them to still have some money, or they might leave because they've been convicted of some kind of sex crime in which case it would hurt you every time that paycheck was sent off to them. Um, yeah, and you, and you just have to think about about how you feel and how you will feel, because bands don't tend to split up in a really friendly way. They tend to be a little bit of sadness around or a bit of anger. Um, so you have to imagine that time to some degree. Um, a really good time to do it is before anything gets anything starts to generate too much money you need to work it out you don't necessarily well i don't think you need to work it out on day one you know if you're if you're 16 and you've just formed a band just enjoy being in a band that's great you don't need to get too too delvey into it but once you've got a set of songs that you think okay we're really pleased with these six then maybe at that point you want to have that conversation so before you go and play live yeah um trying to think if there's anything else around copyright i mean there's loads around copyright i just don't want to give you too much it's the big the big stuff is that copyright exists it is yours by right once you set it down in some fixed format um and it includes the sound recording and the and the song um that's the that's the big one for now and, and if anyone wants to know more then then um, we can do a one to one. I think one to ones are possible as part of this, actually, a part of this project. Um, so contact Kath about that. That would be good. Um, okay, so taking your band forward, I'm just going to do a little section on this. Do ask questions. If, if you've got questions you want asked, do ask them because I can easily interrupt myself. Um, how long have we got left? Not very long. I'm, I'm going to aim to wrap up slightly early. Um, there is a lot, depending on, depending on your, your knowledge and your, obviously I'm talking to everyone. When I do one-to-ones, I'm talking to your specific case. So I'm talking to your knowledge. Um, so this is a bit vaguer than I would do for people on a one-to-one, -one, but I think it will still be useful. You may not know how the music industry functions and if I'm honest, I think a lot of the music industry doesn't know how it functions. Um, for example, PRS are now in talks about streaming and about who takes what money. So they've suggested that they take 8% uh, of every stream. Um, you probably don't even know. Yeah, see, again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the general too little. There is a thing called PRS, the Performing Rights Society, and that collects the money that is generated by songs in this country. Um, they also collect through other collection agencies around the world. But if you write your song in this country, if you want to earn money from it, the way to do it is to register with PRS. And then they collect it from radio stations, uh, live gigs, all sorts. And they pay the songwriter keeping a bit for themselves. They've got quite nice offices with all uh, glass and chrome. Do you know, it's all, it's all very nice. So they're not, they're not poor. Um, 
but and there is a hundred pound fee joining that so what you tend to do is you wait until your songs are generating some money so when you're going to be on the radio that's a really good time to join prs because that way you get your money um but your first paycheck from radio one pays for it makes sense uh christmas is coming ask for it for a birthday present you only pay once you just pay to join and then you are a member of PRS. Uh, if you play a live show, it's normally 4.2% of the gig ticket goes to PRS. So if you imagine somewhere like the lounge bar, that's some money, you know, maybe they're getting 40 quid, 50 quid, um, goes to PRS. And then they separate that out by all the songs that were played. So if you you fill in a sheet and you look at which which songs were played and it gets divvied out uh it's not quite as simple as that but it's that's the ballpark of it if you play so reuben played um a gig in hyde park where they headlined the second stage and at that point you get a, a sizable bit of money because what prs have done is they've taken 4.2 percent of a festival so i don't even know how many people were there i mean not loads but you're probably talking fifty thousand people so 4.2 percent of fifty thousand people split out between everyone very nice thanks you also get slightly more because you've been a headliner so they they ratio it slightly differently so so those things actually come in incredibly handy um i can't even remember how i started talking about this it was it, i wasn't talking about prs I was talking about something else. Um, oh, the the setup of the industry and how the industry doesn't even know what it's doing. So we've been live streaming since way before March, but certainly heavily since March. And it's taken till November before PRS have worked out what they want to charge people for doing it. And it was obvious there would be a charge. You know, that's not that's not particularly a surprise um, that somebody would try and charge for it. It wasn't always going to be PRS um but it it wasn't obvious it was going to be eight percent because that double what they normally charge for a gig so it's a bit strange um i think really they're probably trying to make up their losses because obviously all of the events that haven't happened that means that they haven't had their money coming through so it's tough time um but the the essential way every part of the industry thinks that the industry revolves around them um i've seen the uh, Music Venue Trust did a really good, uh, like, uh, visual representation of the industry with venues and artists right at the centre of it. I've seen others done by the record industry, where the record industry and the artists is part of it. I've seen ones done by uh, the publishing industry, where it's all about the song and the artist. Most people feel they have to mention the artist, so the artist does crop up quite a lot. Um, I think for me, the way it should function is around the artist, but I think quite often it doesn't. And I tell you why the artist tends to come and go. The industry tends to stay there. So universal records is still going to be universal records in 30 years. How many of the artists who were signed to universal this year will still be around in 30 years? Not many. And that's, an important thing to understand it doesn't mean it's good it doesn't mean i recommend it but it's an important thing to understand the managers the agents the people who work at record labels they all know each other they all hang out together they all go down the same gigs together and they see countless 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 tiny little bands come and go a few of them get signed and then a few of those are successful um i had friends in a band who got signed to a massive deal. They got signed to Atlantic Records. Uh, they had all their songs ready to go. They recorded an album. Label didn't like it. They said, go and re-record it. They went to re-record it. Then they said, it's not quite ready yet. It's not quite the right time. And then they dropped them. And they never got to release their record. I had other friends who were in a band who they, they got dropped on the day of release. So on the day their album came out, the label dropped them and cut all support. So it never got marketed, it never got any spend, it just got released. Um, so many of those things happen and you can't really plan for that. You can't, you can't, you can't. Um, 
I think it's it's very important to understand that the industry is is the industry and it plows its way onwards um, and they don't see the artist as important I see the artist as important and you see the artist as important and a lot of grassroots people I would say see the artist as important higher up the chain there are still people who see the artist as important there are lots of people who see the artist as important. There are some great people involved in the music industry, like really great. But the way that industry as a whole works is that the artist isn't the most important. People just say they are. Um, so you kind of want to have that thought at the back of your head that all of these people you're making friends with, they, they probably do really like you and they do really like your music and they do want you to succeed. But they also, somewhere in the back of their mind, they know that they're going to know Barry, who sits next to them at work, a lot better than they're going to know you, you know? So that every day they go to work and go, all right, Barry, how are you, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, how's your, how's your dog or whatever? Um, and they have those conversations. Whereas with you, it tends to be like, oh, you're great, you're brilliant. Yeah, I love what you're doing. You're going to change the world. And, it's, and people do say a lot of that sorts of things. So that, again, it's... It's sort of worth taking with a pinch of salt. That said, for me, the band is the most important thing. The artist is the most important thing. And nobody will care about your career as much as you do. Nobody will care about your band, certainly, as much as you do. So you need to be that unit. You need to be unified. You need to be talking. You need to be on the same page. You need drive. You need vision. And you need to make sure you've got the same drive and the same vision, that you, you all think you're going to the same place. If you think of somebody, I'm using so many old examples, it's embarrassing, but if you think about somebody like Kiss, if one of Kiss had said, no, I don't think wearing makeup's cool, I'm not doing it. I mean, that's, that's ruined Kiss. That's the whole, the whole point of Kiss, was that they did fire breathing and wore makeup. If if one of them said, oh, no, I'm not wearing makeup, I'm, I'm just wearing jeans, you've just ruined the chance of your band. It, they wouldn't have made it with one guy wearing dungarees. It, it, it wouldn't have done it. They had to all go for that same vision. They all had to go for that same look. There are other things where, you know, like if one of the Smiths had decided that he was going to look like Kiss, exactly the same effect like it's, it's just ain't gonna work you can't look like gene simmons stop it um you know so so you you've all got to be on board you've all got to have that same vision with that comes a common understanding of what you will and will not do so if you won't do something for coca-cola you all need to know you won't do something for coca-cola if you do something for anybody that's fine too people who want to play loads and loads of gigs the whole band has to want to play loads of gigs because if the whole band doesn't want to play loads of gigs it's pointless if one of them is going ah, can't be asked mate it just doesn't work or the same if if your plan is to play very few gigs and make them into events if one of them wants to be gigging all the time he will just get frustrated or she will just get frustrated so you have to be on the same page once that is the situation you will discover you're doing a lot of the work yourself so you're plowing in with booking shows filling in your prs forms uh, writing off to record labels dealing with live streaming making little videos getting photo shoots done doing recordings maybe doing some recordings yourselves um so that kind of stuff it's great that you do that. It's really hard. A lot of it is really hard. Booking a show is harder than you would imagine. It's, it's, it becomes ridiculously difficult to persuade a promoter in Southampton that you can pull five people so they should put you on because they've got a band in Southampton who can pull 50, so why would they put you on? Um, but it's good to have done those things because then you appreciate the team you then bring on board. And you cannot be fully successful without some sort of team. I don't think it's possible. I haven't ever seen it anyway. Someone else on one of these talks might tell me I'm wrong. Um, the, the first person, well, an early person that you want is probably a manager. But what all managers would say is, you only get a manager when you need a manager. So when you can't do it all yourself, get a manager. The manager will have contacts 
and can speed things up. But quite often, the manager doesn't do the day to day. So managers, well, a lot of managers don't book the rehearsal room. That's still you. They don't sort out who's picking who up on the way to a gig. They don't sort out who's going to take the photos. There's, you know, there's loads of stuff that they don't do. They're more overarching strategy and hooking you into the industry. As you get bigger, they will do more and more of that to the point when you're someone like Robbie Williams, who has someone with him all the time parking his car and making sure his shopping's turned up. But, but in those early stages, there's no money for a manager to be doing those things. So, so the manager isn't doing those things. And they want to see, you hear it quite often, people want to see the band working harder than anyone else in the team. So if the band are really focused and they're really working hard, then other people want to help them. As soon as that artist gets lazy, doesn't want to do interviews, can't be bothered to record, gets sloppy, the rest of the team lose interest and they don't want to be a part of it. So all of it comes from your drive. Um, so at some point you might want a manager who comes on board and starts to make some of those decisions, takes a bit of the weight off, looks at what's going to help the band. It can be very useful and and I think, I mean, certainly the bands that I look after seem to find it useful. So I look after a band called Matro Rancho, who are local from around here, just doing their first recording feels exciting. I look after a band from Brighton called Sick Joy, who are signed. They've had records out. It's all starting to move in a really good direction. Um, and I manage, well, sort of co-manage, I would say, a guy called Chris Wood who is one of my favorite artists of all time um but he is very self-sufficient so i'm yeah who knows i it feels like i i am useful but i don't know how useful i actually am because he can do everything anyway um i'm very lucky in that all three of those artists are really good focused people well sets of people and person um and they're really uh they're really good people to get on with they write music that i love they function well you know so it's it's not always the case i don't think i would manage very well with someone who was very difficult um bit of a diva all of those things i don't know who knows and you do hear it um So manager, another key person is a lawyer. Now, in the music business, the lawyers are a lot more connected than a lot of other businesses. So if you, the comparison I tend to use is if you are a divorce lawyer, you probably know other divorce lawyers because you've bumped into them at various places or you went to college with them or whatever, and you meet people who've been divorced. But you don't tend to stay in touch with those people because they've been divorced, so your work is done. But in the music business, you are constantly negotiating deals with people. So the lawyers that you, you work with, the managers you work with, the record labels you work with, the artists you work with, you stay in touch. So they're really well-connected people and they have a really good overview of the industry. Um, when I first started managing Ruben, I went and met five different lawyers because I didn't know anything about lawyers and I needed to understand. And your first meeting is free. So you're not losing money apart from the train fare, but you're gaining a real insight into how the industry works and who these people are, and which one you want to work with. And they've all got slightly different advice, but, but they've got some similar advice as well. And that's really useful. Um, wait until you are a serious proposition. So don't just try and meet lawyers when you haven't got your songs together, but when you've got a decent set and people are starting to talk about you and it feels like it's working, that's a really good time to talk to a lawyer. Um, a booking agent, when you get to a point where you are already booking all the shows you know how to book and you're finding it taking up too much time or it's too hard, that's a really good time to get a booking agent. Um, they do an amazing job and they're unappreciated or underappreciated. Um, I've got a lot of friends in the music industry and even I was finding it hard to book shows. Whereas when a booking agent rings up, it just happens, you know, because they go, hi, it's me. I need a gig and they go oh yeah you're the guy that looks after 
muse or whoever of course i'll help you out um so that is a that is a, a very welcome person when that comes but if you've never booked your own gigs you won't know how hard it is so you won't appreciate that booking agent um you've got publicists you know i i genuinely just thought that people got in the music press or online or radio or whatever because they were good i just thought oh that's you know everyone's just found them and and discovered that they're good and of course that's not the case what happens is you've got a radio bugger who takes things to radio you've got a pr person who takes stuff to all the onlines you've got um uh, you well i mean you've got everyone at the record label and distributor and everybody else trying to push you forwards um I don't know if it's still the case. I'm sure it. I'm sure it is. But if you wanted to get placing in HMV shops, if you wanted the end of an aisle, you had to pay for it. You had to give them some money and a discount on the stock. Um, and there's a lot of that sort of stuff goes on. In terms of PR, it's mostly a bit more wholesome than that. So, you know, you get a PR who is great for your genre. So, say, you know, the guy that was doing loads of samples, you. You find someone who does a lot of that sort of stuff and they take it to radio or they take it to the press and they try and get those people talking about you. They don't have to pay them to do it. You know, it's, it's just a trusted person. So you can do it yourself. You can send off people like Steve Lamack will listen to what you send them. Um, but it doesn't do any harm if it's a friend of theirs who, who's walking through the door with it, you know, or emailing with a link or whatever method we choose going forwards. Um, because it's just another person who recommends it. A, a really good way of thinking about this is if you hear about a band, you personally, if you hear it from a friend who's got similar music taste to you, you take it really seriously. If you hear it from someone at a bus stop who you don't know at all and doesn't look like they're into your stuff, you probably ignore it. And it's the same for everyone in the music industry. If they hear from somebody that they respect, then they will probably give it a try. If they hear from someone totally unsolicited, it might end up in a drawer or a bin or the delete box. You know, it's, it's particularly the case now, I think, where people can email over tracks. So, I mean, quite often you don't have time to listen to a whole track. You've got time to listen to 15 seconds. 20 seconds you're not listening to much so as a gig booker or as a record label you're not listening to loads um i i quite often tell people i went into warner publishing many years ago and they'd asked me to send a cd this is before digital was really a thing asked me to send a cd which i'd done not only had he not listened to it he hadn't even opened the jiffy bag and it said as requested by so and so and it said reuben written across it in big letters like it, it couldn't have been clearer um, but that's the habit that they get into of, of just not looking at things. And you will find more often than not, people won't have, have done that. They just won't have done it. Um, the last thing I'm going to say, um, oh, where are we? Yeah. Any questions? Keep coming with questions. That's fine. Keep forgetting to check, but I will check. Um, or, or like I say, email me later on. Um, when you are thinking about your band so you've done all of the things you've done all the legwork you've practiced you've got good you've got a team around you it's all starting to function you still have to keep doing all of the things so you still have to keep talking you still have to keep practicing you still have to keep rehearsing you still have to keep songwriting you have to keep trying to be the best band that you can be the best version of you that you can be now that can be really tiring. That can be quite exhausting, in fact. And what you need to do is also cut yourself some downtime. It's really good to have two weeks off or a month off. What is really bad is if you all go at different times, because if say you all say we really need a month off, I'm going to go in September, you go in October, you go in November, then that's three months you've lost. So, it's a really good idea to try to tie in around each other so you do take a breather. It can happen in small ways. So I was in a band that used to rehearse three times a week and meet up the rest of the time. And every now and then we would just do one. 
because we just needed that rest. It was important to have a rest. And we didn't really know that's what we were doing. We just did it but because we were quite in tune. But it was important, and it was one of the ways that kept us running. Um, I think if you rehearse too little, it's it doesn't really help you, and it's quite slow going. But you can rehearse too much, um, and it's just keeping an eye on that. So maybe you'll do, you know, a week of rehearsals you know, you could hire a cottage somewhere and do a week of rehearsals, but then the next week you don't do anything or you do one, you know, because you've already seen too much of each other for that. Um, there's uh, there's a rehearsal space in Farnborough called The Rooms. A lot of bands knew, know, know it. If you're local, you'll probably know about that. Um, and it's a really good place to rehearse. You probably want to do it a couple of times a week. You don't want to be there five days a week because you have no money left, but it's it's a nice, easy setup where the PA is already there. You walk in, do your stuff, go again. A lot of it is how you use your time when you're together. So if you if you function well as a band, if you all turn up on time, you get set up quickly, you make the most of your time. That is a lot of where you will find your time. I, I know a lot of bands who who don't feel like they've got enough time to do the rehearsals. You do. You just need to prepare. So you need to make sure you've got some food with you. You can eat that in a break. That's great. Eat it when you get there, eat it while the drummer's setting up. So it always take a bit longer. You know, there's there's lots of ways around how you do it. There's people who go, oh, and no, I'm working. Till when? What time? Work around it. You know, I need to see my girlfriend. Okay, see her afterwards, see her before, see her tomorrow. There's, there's ways around it. A, a set day is a really good way of doing it so that you always rehearse on a set day. Anyway, um, what I was going to say was, remember that downtime. Really look after your mental health. Being in a band is the best thing in the world. I mean, it, I think it probably is the best thing in the world. I can't think of anything better than being in a band. But it can also be incredibly hard. It can be very emotionally draining because you pour so much of yourself in that you're giving a lot of you. If someone says they don't like your band, you get a bad review, you get someone boos you at a gig, you get another band member who's horrible to you, uh, you get someone else in one of the other bands who's horrible to you, it can really it can really be hard. And financially as well, there's a lot of outlay in being in a band in those early stages. You know, you're buying sticks or skins or strings or guitars or amps or whatever. And that's really important. That's I, actually that was one thing I meant to say earlier on was your quality of gear. It doesn't have to be amazing, but it does have to be professional level. It has to be decent. So I don't think you need the most expensive guitar in the world, um, but you need something that works. You need something that's OK. You don't want something that's always going out of tune. Um, I, I think people sometimes get too hung up on gear and they spend too much on gear. They become a bit obsessed by it. It's just a tool to do a job. But you need to make sure that it's it's functional, you know, uh, that is important. Um, but yeah, just bear in mind that it's stressful being in a band. And then you layer on top of that all the other things that happen when you're in a band, like all the life events, like I said before, you know, the, the deaths and births and debts and housing and all sorts. Um, you need to be gentle on yourself and be gentle on each other. It, it it doesn't help if you're down on each other. There are times where you decide you're in the wrong band and you have to go, or you decide someone else is in the wrong band and they have to go. And those are very difficult choices, but you need to make them with your eyes open. So you are choosing, is this something that we can help with? Can we make this person better or happier or whatever? Or is it something that's too difficult for us? And we can still be their friend, but we can't we can't have that business relationship with. It just won't work. Um, I've been involved in a few cases where a band member leaves or a band splits up or whatever, and it's really hard because you are close by that point. You are you are normally quite tight. But it saves them a world of pain if they're not the right person, and it saves you a world of pain if you're not the right person. Um, I'm trying to think of a famous example, and I can't. But there are there are lots and lots and lots of examples where 
somebody leaves and it's much better for them that actually they're happier not being in the band what was making them miserable was being in the band or they were the problem bringing the whole band down you know it it can happen and again it's about being honest and kind so much of this it's a people business all of this is a people business but nothing more so than being in a band so if you want to be in a, a better band than you're in I mean, the obvious answer is leave and join a better band. If you see one that needs you, you, you can do that. But if you've decided that this is your band, the way to make it better is to understand everyone in that band and what makes them excel, what makes them at their best, what makes them the best person in that band that they can possibly be, and then build a really great team around that band. Um, I'll just see if there's anything I've missed. Uh, Oh, Barney, could you remind people where to find me? I could. So anyone who's watched all of this, well done. When I started this, I said a little bit about who I am. My name is Barney Jevons. I run a thing called Kick Arts UK. So you can get hold of me at Barney at kickartsuk.com. Um, I do one-to-one -one sessions. I would love to do a one-to-one -one session as part of this. Um, they are normally £60 for an hour, but I think, and quite often you need more than one, but I think there might be something that Kath, uh, Kath, Catherine uh, can arrange. So talk to me about that, and I'll see if there's funding to cover it. Um, also... I do management, like I said, Sick Joy, Matro Rancho, Chris Wood. I also work with Hannah James quite closely, who's an award-winning folk artist, and I'm, I'm a tour booker for her, for Platform 4 Theatre, who are amazing, who are doing a musical, not a musical, but doing a piece that involves a lot of music. Um, Rowan Reingans, who's another award-winning folk artist and theatre maker. Um, I also do the lecturing at UCA, the music composition and technology course is great. Um, they're, and they're amazing. If there's anyone watching from that, hello. Uh, they're an amazing bunch, absolutely incredible. Um, I feel like I do other stuff as well, but I can't think what it is. So uh, apologies if I've forgotten your bit of what I do. But yeah, get in touch, get in touch and um, make your band better. Do you know the biggest bit of advice for anyone who's just joined us you don't need to watch anything make your band better by working hard at it and being nice that's it that's as complicated as it is if you want to be good at it work hard at it learn about it not just the bits you like but the bits you don't like learn about the paperwork learn about the industry learn about the copyright learn how everyone else functions what does your PR person need from you they need a good photo there's nothing they can do without a good photo so you need to work hard at your photos as well as your music if they need a good recording you need to work hard at that and you need to build your rapport with that producer or you need to do your own stuff uh, I'd better shut up otherwise it'll be time for um who's on next is it Ben I think it's Ben very cool and uh, Ben I used to put Ben on he's lovely he's lovely an amazing man who knows so much in fact he knows more than me so ask <laughs> ask any questions ask him throw some in ask him about copyright it will put him right off he won't know what's going on okay so thank you all very much and a massive shout out to Catherine for doing this it's an incredible thing to pull this off and to have this happening in Alton is is astonishing it is and i don't think people realize a lot of venues have not got this sort of program it's to do this diy boot camp is phenomenal so hats off to you <laughs>